Okay, we're going to take a look at the U.S. Civil War, the latest game uh, from GMT, and it's designed by um, Mark Simonich. And I can say in a word that this is one beautiful game. Now I'm just going to set it up here. We're going to take a look at the charts, the components, um, the counters, uh, the cards, and uh, look at the map. Give me an idea what this game is all about. Uh, I'm very favorably impressed with this game. Let's take a look. Okay, one thing I noticed after I punched it and clipped it was uh, that you're going to be hard-pressed to get everything in the box. Now, GMT, thank goodness, has gone to these large, sturdy, uh, taller boxes. So the components will fit in. I might point out that the uh, maps are mounted, and they're beautifully mounted. They lie very flat. They're very good. Uh, like I said, you're going to be hard-pressed, though, to get everything in. The uh, maps will fit in, of course. You'll be able to use one tray. At least I was able to use one tray. And I had to go to bags for several of the control markers, naval units, things like that. Uh, you get little cards with it. Beautiful charts. Uh, and everything will fit in the box. Um, but like I said, you have to use your imagination. I don't think you're going to be able to get two trays in there. But let's take a look at the map. Uh, it is just beautiful to behold. Now, the map is very big, and I mean big. You get two sections, both mounted, and I'll pan the camera a little bit here, and you can see it's actually filling my um, war game table. Now, luckily, I have a fly leaf here, which I can lift it up if we run out of space for charts and stuff. I started playing this with a friend the other day, and uh, we are, um, well, we're enjoying the experience, to say the least. I'll um, stand up on the chair here, and we'll try to get the overall view of what the map shows. Okay, I'm standing up on a chair here to give you an idea of what it covers. So we, um, in the west, it ends up uh, in the western part of Arkansas, the Kansas border. You've got Texas here, and of course it goes west to Philadelphia in the far east, and uh, Florida here. Of course the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. But to really appreciate this map, you have to look at it closely, and that's what we'll do so now. Just look at a couple of hexes, and uh, you'll see that Mark has just an outstanding job on this map. I think it is now the, uh, well, I might as well let the cat out of the bag. I think it's the best strategic game out there on the Civil War. Let's, let's take a look at some of the hexes close. Okay, well, Civil War buffs are always interested in the uh, Washington, Fredericksburg, Richmond front. And there you can see it. Um, he's got several classes of rivers, which is really nice. You've got these wide, I'll call them ocean inlets, coastal. You've got marsh, and you've got these secondary rivers that are kind of wide, and then these thinner rivers. And the Mississippi and the Ohio are depicted in a different way. You can see that they're wide, with these little wee dots to show them, and the Ohio. Now that's a space we're all familiar with with Civil War games, Cairo or Cairo and Columbus, Kentucky, which is important, and down the Mississippi to New Orleans and uh, Forts Philippe and Fort Jackson. It's a very beautiful map. It's got large hexes too, which is nice, and we'll look at the counters in a moment. You've got a very, very detailed terrain effects chart, because there's lots of different terrain uh, in this game. I'm going to explain the action cycle and the dice differential later, but that's one really nice feature of the game. Now, inevitably, people are going to compare it to For the People and Lincoln's War and Victory Games Civil War and maybe even the old SPI, American Civil War. I can say that Mark has taken the best features of all of those games and put it in this. Now, For the People, for example, is a um, CDG game, and we must judge it as such. This is a non-CDG game, so we're really uh, comparing apples and oranges here. But I think this is a superior simulation of the war than For the People is. For the People is a great game. It's a wide-open game. It's very popular at WBC every year, and I think it will remain popular for years to come. But I think if you want a serious simulation of the American Civil War, this might well be your cup of tea. Let's take a look at some of the counters. No surprises here. The infantry counters are reminiscent of For the People. They're generic strength points with the various denominations. Ones, twos, fives, sixes, sevens, so on. Also the Confederates, same kind of idea. 
you've got three levels of fortifications, which really makes this game interesting. You've got to build them and uh, upgrade them. Three levels, which is really nice. You also get entrenchments, which is, um, I put them in a bag. Like I said, you're going to need a bag and tray this game. There's your entrenchment counters. Uh, the setup markers, I put in a small bag. It takes, a, oh, maybe, what, ten minutes to set this game up. And your control markers, very much like for the people. And you get these small little wee uh, special action cards. They're physically small, and uh, they're generic to the theater, because this game is divided into the East, West, and Trans-Mississippi Theater, very reminiscent of the old um, Civil War game by Victory Games. Uh, Mark has taken the best of that game and put it into this uh, uh, version of, his, of the Civil War. You get lots of leader counters. Lots. They're well done, too. Very well done. Nice graphics. Beautiful looking game. And the counters are large and they're thick. Which is great for these poor old eyes of mine. Now we come to a controversial part of the game. And um, when the game was being talked about on ConSim, we all... Um, chimed in and gave our views on the uh, kind of the scripted leader system here. And that's the turn record track, which indicates when a leader comes on the board and where he may be um, transferred or eliminated. And a lot of us, and I was one of them too, was against it. We didn't want scripted leaders leaving the board. For example, Stonewall Jackson was killed in the spring of 63, so Stonewall Jackson will be removed from the board at that time. And we were all against that. But when you play the game, here's Jackson here. See, when Jackson's killed, he's replaced with Yule. But when you play the game, at least what I've played of it, um, it's not a big factor. It's no big deal. The game has got so much going for it that this leader scripted table just fades away to nothing. You've got nice cards to set up the armies of the uh, stacks get unwieldy which so far, when I in my playing, they've been pretty good. Beautiful charts on a nice quality uh, cardboard. Uh, a complex combat results table, which is kind of neat. You've got some battles on the small level where you're rolling one die. Larger battles, you're rolling two die. And on the big, big ones, you use three uh, dice. Um, it's got arsenals in it for the um, Confederates. You can build them according to this chart. He'll roll a dice, and the arsenals will be built in these uh, various states. You don't know where the next arsenal will be. There's a blockade table. There's all kinds of naval rules. Um, might as well bring them up because they're not complex, but um, Mark has done something that I haven't seen much in uh, very many games. And um, this caused a bit of controversy, too, on cons, and we were all talking about it. I got to page 21 in the rules, and, of course, it says here, you know, stop, you've read enough rules to play all the scenarios. We recommend you play at least one before moving on to the advanced rules. And that's what I'm doing. Uh, it's a good recommendation by Mark. Uh, I think a lot of people are plunging into the advanced rules and the naval rules, and I think that's a mistake, because... Oh, three quarters of the questions I'm seeing on CONSIM have to do with uh, naval um, uh, questions. So uh, I urge you, if you get the game, just try the basic game at first. Now, I am a war gamer too, and we all like to plunge in right into the advanced game. But um, I'm telling you, the basic game is not basic. There's enough in there. And uh, the, the naval is handled fine. It, it's, it's, I, the game is everything I wish it could be. Um, will I jump into the naval rules advance someday? Of course I will. Sure I will. Just like everybody else, I'll, I'll jump into them. But uh, Mark recommends that you um, uh, learn the basic game uh, first, and I think that's a good suggestion. Here's some uh, more charts with a train on it. And uh, there's some of the errata I've got off of uh, Consim. Fortunately, most of it is just Q&A. There isn't a lot of errata for the game. Uh, one minor errata is the... Um, hex at um, New Madrid. In the basic game, they're allowing uh, naval control for the Union only to go as far as New Madrid. Uh, that is errata. And I think the only other big bad errata was um, naval control. Nothing really bad, actually. Uh, the errata was, uh, was trivial. Most of this is Q&A. So um, let's set up a few counters and situations 
and uh, show you why I like the game and why it is such a good simulation. Well, before I do that, I should mention these uh, wonderful setup cards. Um, I like the old-fashioned way of setting up games with nice pictures to set up the counters. Now, uh, I just wish to God more games would have this. Uh, I mean, come on. Uh, setup cards were used in the 1958 version of Gettysburg by Avalon Hill. And why more games don't have setup cards, I'll never know. Uh, it just makes it much easier to set up the game. And... Uh, these just help a lot. We've got the 61 scenario, 62, 63, and so on. Uh, of course, we're all plunging into the campaign game, at least a lot of us are. I'm starting in 61. I think the 61 setup is great. Lots of good opening moves um, and, and variability. And uh, when we get to the dice differential system and how the game works, you'll see why. Okay, one of the things that Mark has resurrected from the old Victory Games Civil War was this dice differential system. Now we all liked it in the Victory Games Civil War and uh, it certainly works here. It's just a great mechanism. What happens is each player, the Union and the Confederate, will roll one die for initiative. In this example, let's say the, uh, well, of the Union rolls a five and we'll say the Confederate rolls a three. So the Union player will have the initiative and you record the dice difference with this little marker. Difference of two. Five minus three is two. Dice difference of two. And there are four action cycles. So the union will move first in this example, and you'll have two action pulses to activate and do things on the map. He'll perform those two actions, and then the Confederate will perform his two actions. Then you'll move the initiative to the second action cycle and you'll roll again and this is what is really cool about this game because well let's just do it as an example here we'll roll Union rolled a two and the Confederates rolled a three so the difference is one but this time the Confederates will be going first and the dice differential is only one now he's got special rules for when the dice differential is one which means you can move, perform one action in each theater. Now here's the Eastern Theater. He's got the Western Theater delineated by these, this red line here. And then you've got the Trans-Mississippi. So each turn, not only will you not know how active you're going to be, you will not know which player will move first. And this is where the game really gets good. And you do this cycle four times. So you've got a lot of movement within this action cycle of four, or maybe none at all, depending on what the dice difference is. Now, for example, if you get the Union gets a six and the Confederate rolls a one, he's got special rules for a very active dice differential of five. And this is the actually on to Richmond rule. When you get a dice differential of five, the Union player pretty well is forced to make some kind of move in the East and on to Richmond. Kind of the equivalent of the on to Richmond card there and for the people. And it's this little wee dice differential action cycle that makes this game just come alive. It really does. I'll try to give you an example. Now I can't possibly explain all the game rules in a short video, but I'm um, just trying to illustrate how neat the action phase can be. Let's say the dice differential is two and the Union has two action phases. He might want to move McClellan as one of his phases. And McClellan's got a movement factor of four, so in this case he would go kind of one, two, three, and capture Grafton. And he'd spend a point to put a, a control marker down there. That would be McClellan's move. And let's say as a reaction, this force here at uh, Staunton decided to move. Now when you don't have a leader, he can't move as far. He can actually only move three hexes. So we'll say this Staunton force goes one, two, three. Now, in the next action cycle, we don't know who's going to be moving first. So what could happen is McClellan could move first again, perhaps going through Philippi here and then down to Summersville, like that. Or this force might move first and come up to block him. So you've got a lot of interaction between forces. 
with this dice differential and initiative system. And uh, I tell you, when you get moving a lot of counters on the East Front and stuff, it's a gem of a game. Now, Naval, I have to mention Naval. I mean, it's got all the stuff that For the People had. Of course, you've got the Union with the ability to blockade the Confederacy. The blockade zones are divided in four, much like For the People had it. Now, except on this game, since it's much more tactical, the Union is actually going to have to land and destroy or capture each individual port. You might remember in For the People, you kind of close down a whole area. This game is, again, because it's tactical, you're going to have to go in and close Wilmington yourself, or capture Fort Macon and close Beaufort, uh, Roanoke Island, um, down here Fort Morgan in uh, Alabama. It's also got the old Galveston hex, which we're used to um, from For the People, and there are a lot of parallels. Of course, there's a whole game going on here in the Cairo, Columbus, Paducah area. I mean, the war was very important in this area. The opening moves are very important. The game does set up with a fortification at Dover, representing Fort Henry and Donaldson. And um, I tell you, the Confederates are thin on the ground, I tell you. When you, I've played Confederates, and man, 1861, it's just, you're defending with ones everywhere. You feel the, um, the pressure, let me tell you. Now for the Union, of course he's got more forces, but bringing them to bear is the, um, is the thing. It's very hard. And that's what makes the game so so neat. Now, the game, much like for the people, is kind of decided by the status track. You're going to have the status track where as the Union captures these gray resource spaces here, for example Raleigh, the resource level or build points for the Confederacy will go down. So the Union is trying to get these build points down and, as he, and if the uh, Confederate captures Northern Territory, his um, his BPs will go up. Um, so you've got the sliding scale that's really determining the game, much like For the People was. And again, you must be aware of this, the generals here, because generals will come on the board, they might be removed, and then they might be promoted. I kind of like that. So the reason Mark did that was, at least in his explanation was, he didn't want the game to be about just about leadership. Leadership is darn important, but the game isn't about leadership. Um, for example, we all know in Civil War games you're going to want to have Grant and the best, largest army you've got, and you want to have Lee in the other one. Well, this game doesn't quite work like that. Grant does come on right here, turn four, winter. But he's a two-star general, and uh, he's later graduated to a three-star general in the summer of 62. So you have to obey this strict sonority process, and, you know, it works. It just it just works. I can say a word about these cards. Okay, it's a um, card assisted game, not a card driven game. And you get these small cards, pretty well broken down into just the three theaters: East, West, Trans Mississippi, and this one saying any. Same with the Confederate. Now, in the basic game, you're going to need a naval card to do naval moves, and uh, that's why people, uh, some people, have jumped to the advanced rules. They think, oh, well, that's too simple. Uh, no, I don't agree with that. The basic game works just fine with these uh, cards doing the naval. Because um, when you go to the advanced rules, you can also move naval every turn. and um, You can also de-emphasize the war by doing too much naval, too. Not saying you'd win it, necessarily. But anyway, these, these cards add a lot to the game. Uh, these can be used over and above uh, your moves with the action cycles. And overall, you're going to get about two of these cards per turn. Um, not much else I can say about the game. Well, I could talk about this game for hours, but uh, that would defeat the whole purpose of the video. Just want to give you an introduction to the game. So my final word on the game is, uh, yeah, it's one fine game. The U.S. Civil War by Mark Simonich. Um, anybody who knows me uh, knows that I don't give masterpiece status to too many games. I think I'm only giving it to two. Republic of Rome, I think it's a masterpiece game. The other one is Empire of the Sun, masterpiece game. And I'm giving this title uh, masterpiece level. The U.S. Civil War by Mark Simonich. In my opinion, it's the finest game and simulation currently available on the American Civil War. Thank you for watching.